This is Support is Sexy, episode 186, with Lisa Bendero, founder and CEO of Nice Pipes. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday and welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am so happy to have you here you know it just would not be the same without you. And I hope you had an amazing weekend if you're listening to this in real time. And we have an amazing episode for you today, an interview with Lisa Bendero, who is just fantastic. She is the founder, the creator, and the CEO of Nice Pipes Apparel. Now, if you're a fan of Shark Tank, you may have seen Lisa on a recent episode in January. She was up there doing her thing, presenting her business, and had quite an interesting experience exchange and result of her appearance on Shark Tank. If you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it for you, but be sure to listen out in this episode about her experience before going to Shark Tank and how she feels after having been there. So in addition to hearing from Lisa about that, you'll also hear about this idea of taking inspired action, going forward with your business, knowing when to move on, and so much more. It's chock full of great information. I know I always say that, but truly, this is a great one. So what you'll learn from Lisa on today's episode is how to leave that thing that doesn't make you happy, even if what's next isn't perfect. So important. How to get over the fear of changing course, the first steps to take when you have a new product idea, how to take inspired action, why people are your greatest resource, remembering that it's important to know what you want and what you don't want, remembering for every big yes, there may be five no's, but you have to keep going. Also, how to walk away from what may seem like the deal of a lifetime, being focused on what matters most to you, your life, and your business, how to get comfortable trusting your gut, what Lisa learned about herself and the kind of business she wants for Nice Pipes after Shark Tank. She also shares what I think was great, the book that prepared her for that experience. So be sure to listen out for that. And lastly, you'll also learn why you have to surround yourself with people who support you and allow you to be vulnerable. So as I said, great information, great interview with Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. And for all of you listeners, make sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can see links for all of the people, resources, books, all the great advice that Lisa mentions in this episode. We'll have links for you there at supportissexypodcast.com. All right. So without further ado, Lisa Bendero. So Lisa, thank you so much for being here for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Of course. Now, first question. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? So I've really never... It's funny that you say that because I never really uh, realized right away that it was something that I loved. It kind of just fit with my personality. I love, I'm very analytical person, Mm -hmm. um, but I also love the execution piece of any project. And I realized over time that as I started this business, that 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 really was what being an entrepreneur was all about, that, you know, you're involved from start to finish in every part of the, of of every level of of producing a product or starting a business. Um, You're really an active player when you're discovering problems or opportunities. And I I loved the aspect of entrepreneurship that that keeps you involved from start to finish. And then um, kind of you you become you become the the discoverer of the problem and the executor of the solution. And that that's very much in my personality. And and I realized later, like, oh, that is what an entrepreneur is. This must be the right the, the right gig for me. Right. It was always within you, even though you didn't know exactly what it was. Totally. And now I use that term entrepreneur. And it's funny because I even now get a little like um, nervous when I say like I'm an entrepreneur because I never thought of the label as being as such, but it totally is who I am just personality wise, uh, Mm -hmm. naturally. Excellent. Now, where did you grow up? So I actually grew up in Atlanta. 
You did? Um, oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You could tell me some place. Well, have you been here in a while? Do you come back often? I, I do. You know, my family doesn't live there anymore. So I'm there, you know, maybe once in a while for okay. like Okay. So you can, you're uh, no help to me then. I'm no help. <laughs> I, I, the only thing, only place I can point you is my favorite chicken wings in the, in the whole world are at a place called Three Dollar Cafe. Three Dollar Cafe. Okay. And every time I'm in Atlanta, I try to go there. Um, um but I grew up in Atlanta. I went to school, kind of lived all over. I went to school in Michigan, lived in California for a long time. And um, now I live in New York. What was Lisa like as a young girl? You know, I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I am I'm about to be a mom. And I'm Yay, just kind of, yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to think like, what was I like as a little girl? And I think I was actually very similar, you know, in the sense that I wanted to understand things, understand things in great detail. Um, I remember getting into guitar and buying like all these different music books and staying in my room and like learning all, teaching myself all the different chords and playing all these different songs, really throwing myself into projects when I, when I felt a passion for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, I think that really is a personality trait that's gotten, that's come back with, with starting my own business because you kind of lose it. I think a little bit in your twenties when you're like being pulled in a million different directions and kind of trying to figure out who you are. Have you started thinking about it more though recently? You think, because like you said, you're about to be a mom and you're wondering what is my child going to be like? Yeah, I think I'm wondering what are they going to be like? You know, you think about the superficial, like what are they going to look like? But then you start to remember what you were like as a child. And I think, also, there's something about being in your 30s where you start, as for women especially, where you start to know yourself a little better mm -hmm. and you start to be able to um, understand your personality and, and what, work, what, what makes you tick and what works for you and what doesn't. And I felt, at least for me, my experience was in my 20s, I didn't, I totally couldn't tap into that part of myself. So You're still kind of figuring it out and experimenting. Yeah, yeah. And then I think you start to know yourself a lot better in your 30s and it's easier to reflect back on when you were younger and say like, oh, that piece was there then. And you know, it's still here now. And you kind of, you find those connections. Who would you say were some of your greatest influences growing up? Um, growing up, well, def growing up, definitely my mom. She was one of those moms who worked full time, who would like wake up, make us breakfast, make our lunch, go to work, work till six, seven o'clock, make dinner, come mm -hmm. home, Clean, make dinner, clean up, help us with our homework, and then like go, get back on the computer and work. Um, so that that dedication to her family and to her job is something that I admire so much, um, and something that I definitely looked up to. And more recently, there's a there's a great a more like emotional intelligence. There's an author, Brene Brown, who I really right. is a huge inf influence on me. Are, are you familiar with Brene Brown? Yes, I love. I've read Daring yes. Greatly like three yes. times. Yeah. So that and the gifts of imperfection and her TED talks. They're just. I mean, they to me they are so, um, like they just create such a solid foundation for for anyone, for women, for men. My husband read the books too. And they're just such an amazing foundation for you as you're dealing with your life, both personally and professionally. Yeah, she's amazing. I love her. She's story. amazing. I'm going to link to the books and to the TED Talk. The TED Talk is how I first saw her. And then once I read the book, I was addicted. Yes, exactly. Same here. And then I read Gifts of Imperfection when I was prepping uh, for Shark Tank. And I swear it's like what got me through it. Really? See, I haven't read yeah. that yet. So I'm excited to read that. Yeah. Excellent. Now, what kind of work did you think you were going to do once you graduated high school and moved on did you have an idea that you were going to go into fitness because I know you've been a yoga instructor for a long time yeah um no I actually I really wanted to be an entertainment lawyer mm. everyone always told me that I should be a lawyer because I just have I'm very analytic I love to like analyze things to death mm -hmm. and understand both sides of arguments mm. and um I loved movies and I love storytelling and I figured it was a nice way to be involved you know kind of being in the movie, movie business, but from a business aspect. Mm -hmm. And I actually uh, worked out, I lived out, that's why I moved out to California and I worked in the field for about three, four years and I just really wasn't happy. And that's what got me into yoga. Like I used to go to yoga at my local studio once a week just to try to chill out from the intensity that was the Hollywood life. Mm. And I fell in love with yoga and I quit my job uh, working for a big director in Hollywood and 
started working like part time at the yoga studio just to, while I was trying to figure things out, and it turned into a, like a career. I mean, it turned into my career and my life, and I became a teacher. And I worked for the the same company, Yoga Works, for about seven or eight years before I started Nice Pipes. How did it? How did it feel at that time? Well, I know you were younger, so I know when I was younger, yeah. quitting things wasn't as scary as it can be right. you know, later <laughs> in life. But but still, this idea of you were pursuing the thing that you thought you wanted to do, and then decided, you know what, I'm going to quit this and work at a yoga studio part time. Yeah, that was honestly it was it, it was really scary. Um, it was really scary, and I I meet now with a lot of uh, I get set up often with with girls younger than me in the city who are who are wanting to make career changes and I and they they talk about the fear they have with making a shift or mm-hmm. quitting their job and I rem- and I can it's so visceral like I can feel it I remember because right. your friends who are on the track on a track that seems so um they seem so confident in it and they seem they seem so clear about it and most of my friends from college were like that they knew what they wanted to do. They were doing it, and they were they were succeeding, and they were they were growing professionally in New York. And when you take yourself off the track, and you you know you're 25 years old, and you start over, or even older, 20, you know, like whenever you do it, it's mm-hmm. really scary. It was really scary. It was really hard. I had a lot. I, I I had just lost my father. I had a lot of personal stuff going on, and I just like took this like leap of faith that I just knew I wasn't happy, and I took this leap of faith like. I guess I'm just going to have to figure out how to make it work. And the truth is my mom was so supportive of me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also a huge piece. You know, you, you have to have people around you who are supporting you. Um, it, it, it gives you the strength and the courage to make those jumps. And would you say, in looking back now, that it's important to know, and this is something that I've experienced, so I'm interested what you think, to know that you may not jump right into the next perfect thing. So, for example, you were pursuing being an entertainment lawyer. You thought that's what you wanted to do. Even if that wasn't perfect, you were still on a track, as you said. But then moving into the next thing, the part-time job at the yoga studio may not have seemed perfect, but it was sort of like, that's the next right move. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know... What's interesting about life is is that hopefully it's very long, mm-hmm. and we think we you know we hope life is long, and but but that all that time allows us all these different um, like sections of it or pieces of it, and you feel so stable for one minute, and then like I have friends now who are in their mid thirties who want to change their career now, and they it's even harder for them because they're so deep in it, or they're moms and they left their career and they want to come back to something and they don't know what to come back, come back to like. I think it's all about, and it's funny because we were talking about the book Daring Greatly, like it's all about that, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about it. Whatever age you are, whatever part of your life you're in, having the courage to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and say like, I might fail at this, but I want to try because that's where the victories are is in the trying, not in the winning. That's right. I love that. Oh, I might have to put that on my wall, Lisa. I'll I'll give you credit. I'll put your name beneath it. Lisa said this. That's excellent. So then what point did you get to where you were ready to make that next big transition? You've been teaching, as you said, at Yoga Works for almost a decade. You were there? So I was, I've been, I was practicing there. I was working in operations on the business side. Mm -hmm. And then I did my teacher training in uh, 2010. So about seven years ago. Okay. Um, and I was teaching for a while and also doing, basically I was the teacher, uh, managed all the teaching staff and all of our programs in for the Northeast. So all of our classes, all of our teachers, we had around 300 classes at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was running around the city teaching and I, and I was freezing. I mean, it's free. It's much colder on the East coast than it is in Santa Monica. Right. So I, uh, developed this this product for my personal use these leg warmers that were made from yoga pant material um while i was you know while i was teaching and started wearing them to classes and wearing them to wearing them around the city and all these other students and teachers wanted their own pair and that's when the light bulb happened where i realized like wow maybe i can make a business out of this and that's when i had that moment of like am i going to make this shift now where i'm going to like leave this company that i've been with for seven years to go do this and it was it was another one of those like you know okay I'm gonna take this leap of faith mm-hmm. I've ch- I've changed you know I've I've made changes before I'll make them again and and here's another time to do it. 
Before you started the company, did you have the moment where you were sort of searching for something that would already be out there that would work for you? I know I've heard you in interviews talk about those, you know, horrible acrylic yeah. leg warmers that we used to wear. Yeah. Oh, my God. I ordered every single leg warmer you could ever <laughs> imagine. I had, like, it, we were just cleaning out um, what was my office that's now going to be a baby's room. We were cleaning it out, you know, mm-hmm. to make space. And I, like, have a giant box full of every single acrylic leg warmer every single <laughs> leg warmer compression sock compression sleep that right. you that is on the market everywhere from like eight dollars to a hundred dollars and because there was so much research and development that went into the product once I really launched the company mm-hmm. and they were all just like they didn't fit the bill and I think um I came up with this product as a solution for a problem at a time when active wear and at when not only being healthy and exercising was coming into vogue, but also active wear in general mm-hmm. was coming into vogue and people were wanting to be a little bit more fashionable and stylish with their active wear. So it was kind of this marriage between the eighties leg warmer and like the compression sock that you would find at city sports that had like a lightning bolt on it that like, you know, people don't really want to wear out. Right. Now, what was your first step in once you decided that I'm going to make this, even if before you decided to make it into a business just for yourself, what was the, the first step for you? Was it finding a manufacturer, creating a prototype? How does that work? Yeah, so that was the hardest part because the truth is I didn't have any retail or production background. And I was actually speaking with Entrepreneur Magazine a couple weeks ago and we were talking about like some of the best ways to what do you do when you have an idea for something Mm -hmm. and how do you create it? I mean, it's like, you know, so challenging when you know nothing about that, that space or that industry. And really I had to educate myself on the language of that, um, of, of production. So like, what is a sample? What is a a pattern? Mm -hmm. What is yield? There's like a whole vocabulary list that I had to learn first and I then, once I started to understand all that and thank God for the internet, because you can really immerse yourself in anything that you're passionate about when you find good resources on the internet and with good people, you know, right. um, once I kind of gathered all that information, I actually went to a friend who has a beautiful bra company and told, explained to her everything I wanted to do. And she helped me manufacture my first sample. Um, we made like a couple pairs and those are the ones that I was wearing around the city. Excellent. After that, I went to the Garment Center in New York. Mm -hmm. What would you say, do you remember anything in particular, like you said, searching online, of course, but was there anything in particular that was a great resource for you during that time, sort of starting out, whether it was a book or a website? Um, For me, the best resources are always people. Right. So finding someone who's an expert or not even an expert, but someone who is like well-versed in whatever you're trying to learn about. Mm Mm-hmm. And buying them a cup of coffee or or whatever it is, a juice or a drink or lunch or whatever, and coming prepared, right? So making sure that you have the questions out that you want and really just getting information that way. People have, like your network is your encyclopedia. Remember when we were younger and we always have the encyclopedias like A through Z in our like parent or dad's office or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like that to me, that's my personal network of friends and friends of friends. And people are so generous, have been so generous to me with their time and with their advice. Um, There's so much, there's such a great ability to network now with social media and just finding someone who literally there have been times where I've posted on Facebook, like who's an expert in fill in the blank. Right. Or, and someone's like, Oh, my friend's cousin Mm -hmm. does this for Google. You should meet them. And it's, it's a huge help. I mean, it's a huge help. So I think that's the best way. That's such great advice. And I think of course we're all about it here. We say support is sexy, trying to encourage women to ask for support more. But I think as you said too, sometimes you don't know who that person is, but you reach out to the people you do know and you never know who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Totally. Absolutely. And do you think coming to the meeting, even with your friend, it wasn't just, hey, how you doing? Or maybe there was some of that. But I think you also mentioned too, coming prepared, like this is what I want to make. This is what I want to do. Yep. And and even knowing what you don't want it to be, you Mm -hmm. know, I think that's a big part of it. Like I, you know, I go to meetings now and I try to be very clear with examples on what I like and what I don't like, because it really helps to narrow the focus down to what you're looking for. Right. Now, how did you go about making nice pipes unique from the other things that were out there? Certainly from the acrylic leg warmers and those things. Yeah. But otherwise, what, what, what do you feel is uh, special about it? 
So what makes Nice Pipe so, so unique and so special is the fabric we use. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a suplex fabric and it, it feels soft like cotton. It's kind of like those first yoga pants that came out that feel really soft like cotton. It's like a buttery um, luxe feel to it, but right. they have all the performance pieces that you're looking for when you're working out. So they're sweat wicking, they're stretchy so they don't slip down. They um, are SPF 50. Um, they're mild compression, so they actually aid in your performance and help with recovery, keeping your muscle warm. Mm -hmm. um, so all these different like technological aspects that we've come to expect out of our activewear, out of our like workout clothes, that's what these pipes provide. And then in addition, they extend the length. So all of your crop pants that you can't wear in the winter, you pop on your nice pipes and they extend the length of your pipes and you're not having to go out and buy a new pair of, of, leg warm, uh, of uh, leggings. Right. And you mentioned, I saw in another interview you did, that um, transitional seasons are really a, a big time for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's so many people who enjoy working out outside, whether it's hiking, running, and beyond just working out, like walking your dog in the morning, commuting, nurses. I mean, it... That basically what we've been able to develop is this like ultimate layer mm -hmm. that you can wear at any point because it's breathable and it's sweat wicking and it's comfortable. And with, I mean, let's be honest with the way weather is now, you like really never know what the temperature is going to be. Right. No matter where um, you are. No matter where you are. Um, it's why we do really well in San Francisco because it's, the weather there is so unpredictable, but yeah, the idea is that like these these layers, leg warmers and arm warmers, really work for you, um, so that you have the flexibility. They have the functionality to keep you warm, and they're very easy to take off. So they you have the flexibility of layering instead of having to like wear a jacket mm -hmm. or wear long pants or um, like in your office always have a sweater. Like I have girlfriends who keep them at their desk and just wear them in their office because their office is freezing. Right. I love it. Now, at what point did you decide? I know you said friends or people that you worked with started asking you for them once you started wearing them. At what point did you know that, okay, I need to make, as we said, that another leap and focus on this full time? Yeah. So I started making them for teachers and everyone really liked them and everyone wanted more. And my husband really, at that time I, had, I was married probably a year and a half and he really encouraged me to go for it. I, I put together like a you know, when I say business plan, I use that term very loosely. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, it wasn't like some like big deck that I would have bring to show an investor. You know, it was like, here's what I think it's going to cost me. And mm -hmm. like, here's where I think I'm going to do it. And he really, he, he, uh, really encouraged me to go for it. You know, he's like, this is the time let's do it. Let's take this leap. Like I, I believe in you. And I, I went to the garment center in the city and, and same thing. I asked a friend who asked a friend who connected me with someone who knew someone in the garment center. I met her there. She introduced me to a factory. I showed them what I wanted from the samples. I bought the fabric for, in the garment center. Mm. Um, the thing that made the project a little bit uh, more user friendly for me is that our nice pipes are one size. Okay. So I didn't so have, to have to worry as much sizing. about yeah the sizing because the sizing is the sizing and fit is one of the hardest things to do when it comes to clothes. So I think the fact that th that that piece wasn't there made it much more user friendly for me. And um, one size allows it it, it stretch because it, it has such great stretch in it, and then the compression. If you're a smaller person, it fits still tight. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, you know, that spandex material of yoga pants. Like, I don't know if some, I'm sure some of you have experience where you go into a store and you try on yoga pants and like two sizes really fit you. And then imagine that we're only really fitting the knee to the ankle. Right. So like, I'm, and that was another thing I did. I measured like anyone who would let me, I measured their ankle to <laughs> me <laughs> and their calf circumference because I was trying to figure out like what the average was. So that was that was like another really fun project of just like walking around with a tape measure measuring my friend's uh, ankles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so yeah, that that piece made it you know just a little bit the project a little bit more accessible for me, someone who didn't have that manufacturing background. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the garment center. I made two hundred units, and in various colors. I think we had like five colors to start, and then I. Um, cut the email address for the buyer at Equinox, sent her an email and sent her samples and they loved it and they mm -hmm. put it in 13 stores. Wow. 
Now, how did you get the email? Did you figure it out or you found out and then just decided uh, I'm going to cold email her? Basically, yeah. Like my friend, the one who had the bra company, it was said, you know, I can probably get for you the the buyer's email address at Equinox. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure she gets a million emails a day, but it's worth it for you to just introduce yourself and shoot over an email. Maybe they'll let you do a trunk show. Um, and you know, I kind of emailed her, the buyer saying like, I'm willing to do anything and they just really love the product. And and it turned out it ended up being my, my husband and I in my kitchen putting together like 13 different packages and him, him driving me around the tri-state area to drop them, um, at each studio. You know, because I didn't have distribution or anything like you that. You were distribution. Yeah. <laughs> they, thought I, they thought I was like the courier service, you right. know. They're, that's I was like, amazing. No, that's me. I love the story of one, two, just figuring out the person or the contact that you want, sending them some information. Of course, having a great product is a big help, too. But yeah. also not being afraid to reach out, uh, quote unquote, before you're ready. I think that's yeah. another thing a lot of us do try to wait until, but it's sort of like, I don't have distribution. I am dis- in distribution. We're going to go out yeah. and deliver these. That's amazing. So at that point, was it like, okay, we're really on to something? Yeah, I really felt like we were on to something. I mean, it was tricky. We were attaching all the hang tags ourselves mm-hmm. and packaging everything up. And, you know, and by the way, for every story I have like that, I have a story where I have probably have five stories where I've emailed and never heard back. Right. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the hardest things about about doing anything on doing running any sort of business or putting yourself out there in any way that like there's there's going to be a lot of no's even when there's yeses so right. like I love I love telling that story because it like it's this it's great story and it, it was one of the great moments for nice pipes but there's so many stories where I spent days writing emails and didn't hear anything back and that's the challenging part yeah thank you for sharing that and I think as I would say no is a part of the process right it's sort of like you got to get through those to get to the right yes yeah. But how do you deal with or how did you deal with in the beginning? It sort of gets easier, maybe or maybe not over time. How did you deal with the uh, rejection in the beginning? Um, it's hard. You know, it's hard. You're like putting yourself out there and you're fr- and you're and you you're frustrated because you don't know if it's the product or if it's you or if they just even didn't even read your email. And then the busier you get, you start to realize like, yeah, you get cold call emails, too, and you don't really have time to read them. Mm-hmm. Um with that in mind, I try to read, you know, everything that I get because I know you never know what gem you're going to find. Honestly, I really try to not take anything too personally. That's always been a motto for me, like tr- grow, like the older I get, I realize like people have their own stuff going on mm-hmm. and they have their own budgets they have to meet and they are their own bosses they're trying to make happy and nothing very, you know, very rarely is it about you. Right. And you never, as you say, you never know what's going on in that moment for that person. It might just be simply, oh, they didn't see it. Yep. They didn't see it. Or they like just looked at another leg warmer that was terrible. So now they're off leg warmers or so much of it is like right time, right place. Right. And And I think with with the Equinox thing, it was the right, it was a little bit the right time, the right place. I also think that we had a lot of organic growth because, Mm -hmm. because I was in the fitness industry for so long. Mm -hmm. So it was easier for me to tap into the community in a real authentic, genuine way because it was my life. I mean, it was my friends. It was my, it was my, uh, community. How important is that for even if the person isn't necessarily, um, you know, an instructor or something like that within their industry? How important is it to really intimately know the industry that you're either going after or creating something for? I think it's a huge piece. Listen, I think there's two ways you can look at it. And one is that it's vital to success. And the other is that like to be a disruptor, sometimes you need to be coming from an outsider's perspective, right? Mm. Like you're only going to come up with an innovative idea because you're not you're not in the industry. But once you decide to be a player in the industry, I think you have to spend time to really understand it and understand your customer, understand that community. Um, because I think one, that's how you find success, and two, that's how you find happiness. Like you don't want to. F- you want to. Uh, at least for me, I like to understand things that I'm a part of. Mm-hmm. What would you say is your vision for Nice Pipes now? Where do you want to see it go? So one of the things, yeah, so one of the things I'm really excited about from being on the show, from being on Shark Tank, is that we've been able to really focus on our direct-to-consumer sales from our website. Mm -hmm. Um, And to me, that's really exciting because when when we sell to stores, um, 
I don't get to connect to the customer, right? I'm really only connecting to the buyer at the store. And when we sell to customers on our website, it's just constant communication between me, my, my marketing pieces, whatever collateral, whatever they are, and the people that are buying them and getting their feedback if mm-hmm. they wish it would, you know, like one of the things we realized from being on Shark Tank is that a lot of guys want the product and we weren't even marketing to them and they can mm-hmm. use the product as it is now because it's unisex and we, I just had no idea. Um, and I, I love that. I love that. Like, like search and discovery. Like we talked about in the beginning, you know, when we first started talking that entrepreneurial piece where you're, you're really involved at every level from start to finish. I think that really happens more um, when you're selling directly to the customer. So that to me, that's our main focus is growing our site, growing our, growing our sales on our site and um, coming out with new uh, iterations of the nice pipes, different, prints and styles that we've been asked for you know some people really want them in like nude I would never knew, know that mm. from a store but I know that because I've gotten enough customer service emails that are like oh I wish you had nude right which is so interesting nude in all shades yeah yeah interesting that's great now for everyone listening of course I'll have a link but the website I'm sure everyone wants to know is nicepipesapparel.com beautiful website I love your site so you're starting to sell more through the website it sounds like as you said directly to customers and then in stores is it still in Equinox or is it in a variety of stores you know we've kind of pulled away from selling in stores Mm -hmm. um focus on not yeah yeah I mean we we're doing we did it a little bit in the beginning of the season it's not something that I'm like going after aggressively anymore it just to me feels like our growth potential really lies in selling directly to the customer and it's what I enjoy more Mm -hmm. and that's one thing that I think is so important when you're doing anything entrepreneurial like yeah there are like there's parts of it that you're not going to like you're not going to like every minute of your job but if you can figure out what you what you're passionate about what you enjoy doing it's much more worth your time than getting yourself into a situation where you're running a business that you don't really enjoy Right. Now, you mentioned a couple of times your Shark Tank experience, which I want to definitely hear about. Tell us about what that was like to go to get on the show and then to go on the show. And what was your goal when you appeared on Shark Tank? Yeah. So going on the show was probably the scariest. It was going on the show was the scariest thing I've ever done. Wow. Um, thank goodness for Brene Brown, because I swear sh- those the, the books and her TED Talks about being brave and having courage and, and be, being okay with being vulnerable mm-hmm. are, are, what, are what got me prepared and through that experience. Um, it was really scary. My goal, my goal going on the show was to, was to find a mentor. I really, really wanted to work with Barbara or Lori. Mm-hmm. Um, as I mentioned, I don't have a retail or a production background and... Um, I also don't have, you know, I have an operational background, but it's very focused in my, my expertise is not in scaling a business. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I could have one of them as a mentor, then that would be, that would be an a real opportunity for me to really like scale nice pipes in a serious way. And that was really exciting to me at leading up to the show, leading up to the day, to the moment I walked in there. Um, and, and that's sort focused of focused on getting a mentor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so how did you get on the show? I know there's different ways to audition or different ways to, you know, sort of get in front of them. So I was so many people over the last years had said to me like, Oh, you, you know, you should go on shark tank. This is the perfect product for shark tank. Mm-hmm. It's like a problem solving product. You have a, you have a, you're a yoga teacher who developed it for personal use. Like, you should go on it. And I always thought, I don't know, like, it's, I hadn't really ever seen the show except for once or twice, but I'm like, you knew, like, it's called, it's, the show is called Shark Tank. Like, right. I don't really know, <laughs> right. you know, like, I don't really know if I'm up for that sort of level of scrutiny. And like, I feel like I would just flail. And one afternoon I was like avoiding my inbox and I went onto ABC's website and looked at the application and figured, you know what, I don't feel like answering my emails today. I'm going to do, I'm going to apply to Shark Tank as like mm. a pro- procrastination. And then three months later, I got a call from casting and they were interested. And um, that went into like another four month period of interviews and application paperwork and, you know, documents that you have to go through. And 
more auditioning and it's a pretty lengthy process to get on the show. Right. It's not just send the application in and you're on the next week. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's such a long process. And then even once you shoot it, I shot it last summer. Mm. Um, they tell you, you know, just because you shoot it doesn't mean that they're going to air it. And then you, you wait. I mean, you don't know when you're going to air. They give you a few, just a few weeks notice before you go on. And it just aired this past January, yeah. January, right. That's yeah. right. So once you were on the show, now one of the things that, uh, you know, anyone who saw it and we all know now that you walked away from a deal. Yeah. What was the offer and then what made you walk away? So while the segment is only seven minutes, I was actually in there for an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, I had this like, um, I feel so grateful for it because I had this like major moment of clarity when I was in there negotiating. Uh, Barbara offered me, um, she wanted, she, Barbara, Barbara offered me, she wanted 40% of the business. And what they don't show is we actually, we actually negotiated back and forth for about 15, 20 minutes. You and Barbara. Uh, yeah. Okay. On, the, when, on the, on the show there, it's only a couple minutes, but you know, that's going to happen. I mean, they're not, they're not going to show every single person that goes in there, every detail. Right. Um, but for me, I just had this realization that this business that I love so much that I get to be a part of from start to finish, that I get to um, watch it grow uh, like slowly but steadily, that that was not – I was going to walk out of there and that business wasn't going to exist anymore, that things were going to change. It was going to scale and grow probably pretty rapidly and I would sort I kind of like felt it slipping through my fingertips. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, like yeah. I felt like I was going to wake up, Barbara was going to be my boss and nice pipes as I knew it. And everything I had built was, was, was over. And there was going to be a new version of nice pipes that required a different focus for growth only for growth. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just wasn't the life I wanted. I mean, I just wanted more balance in my life. And I felt like, before going on the show, um, I, I felt this need for, for bigger, better, bigger is better, bigger is better. And I realized that day that like, no, it's not. And I'm really proud of what I've built and I'm really happy with what I've built. And like, this isn't, a, I don't have a problem that I'm solving right now by taking Barbara's money. Right. That's amazing. And how did you, um, how did you sort of get to that in that moment? Was it as you were talking to her, as you said, during the negotiation, which was much longer than the two yeah. minutes people saw on TV? Was it, as you said, you felt it slipping through your fingers. And at that moment, you felt like, no, this actually isn't what I want. Yeah, I mean, I really did, because I was sitting in front of five people who were you know, and listen, to the, they're making a show, they're making a television show. So it's not like a typical situation where you're going in to speak to an investor, you know, so they're, they're trying the show again, the show is called Shark Tank, like they're trying to intimidate you and they're trying to scare you. Mm -hmm. And I and I just I, but I what I felt intimidated and I felt scared and I felt like like there was no appreciation for anything I had done. To, to date and, and you stayed I, very centered on, the, sh on yeah. the show right from what I saw you said people said you seem like you were so grounded I know it's funny because I, that's like the I got this crazy response afterwards from all these people who were like like said they were so proud of me because I seemed so centered and so clear and I was clear I just I, I was clear on what I wanted and what I wanted was not to be made to feel every day like I wasn't good enough and that nice pipes wasn't good enough mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize that by building the business for the last years that I had really like kind of changed the way I looked at myself professionally and that I felt like I really had ac accomplished something. It was like almost when you, when you have, when you are forced to defend yourself, all of a sudden you start believing it too. Right. You know, it was like, I had this moment of like, Oh, I'm defending myself and I believe what I'm saying because I am proud of what I've done. And like, I don't need someone to come and make things better because I, I, I believe in what I've accomplished and I believe I'll be able to accomplish more. It was like that, that, that having to stand up for myself mm -hmm. that forced me to feel proud, which is so weird because you wouldn't think that would be the moment that it would happen. But that's what happened. Yeah. When someone finally challenges you on it, because otherwise you're kind of moving along doing what you do day to day. And then when you're confronted, sort of, as you said, with these people who are trying to trip you up in a way. Yeah. You really get to see what you're made of. And one of the things that Barbara tweeted after your appearance is, 
quote, the fact that Lisa walked away from my deal proves she is a terrific entrepreneur. And she also uh, tweeted something like, don't you dare second guess yourself. Yeah, to use. she's what was that like afterwards, especially knowing that you had walked away from her, someone who you, as you said earlier, wanted as a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. What what was that feeling like? I mean, it was amazing. And, you know, I, when I went when I watched the show, she said that as I, you know, after I walk out of the room, she mm-hmm. says she says like these com- crazy complimentary comments. And I didn't hear any of that. I mean, I was way out, out of the room at that point. And, you know, when you when you're in something when something when you're in something and it happened you know I walked out my husband was like in a in a car off the studio lot waiting for me like he wasn't even a, like on the lot mm. and and he walked out and he's waiting for me and I he's like how you know and he's like like looks like he's just been through like the work like as if I was in heart surgery you know like he's so <laughs> he's so shaken and you know he was so nervous for me mm-hmm. and he said how did you do and I I said to him you know I'm like I think I'm really proud of myself and I never I mean you don't know me your viewers your listeners don't know me but like, I never really said that I never really felt that and I really did feel it in that moment I felt proud of myself um and I think that's what I think that just translated both to the people who are watching the show and to Barbara, Mm -hmm. but it was nice. It was nice afterwards because you don't really know how things are going to be perceived. So it was really nice to hear her say that. And even more to all the emails I got from customers and from just fans of the show, like people were so nice and so complimentary and it just like, honestly, and I said this to the producers because um, you know, the, the producers are so wonderful on the show and they, I, you know, you talk to them after I said, like, I will wake up every day now and feel differently about myself. And that's what I got out of the show. And, and I will, mm. I would never change it for anything, anything that happened. That's amazing. Now, how would you say that being on the show, it certainly has, seems like it's had such an impact on you personally and as an entrepreneur, but how has it shifted your business one way or another? So we got tons of traffic to the site. Um, and a lot of like, I mean, so many orders, so many new customers, so much more brand awareness. I mean, it's just massive exposure. And it's in a way where it's like very genuine because you're talking about your, you know, it's the people who go on that show are entrepreneurs who have blood, sweat and tears there, you know, to build their business. And they mm-hmm. go on there and some of them are and everyone's coming from a different pl- place, uh, you know, a different place of their business and a different place of personally. And um you just it's a story the show the show is a story they're telling a story and the audience gets to engage with you in a way that would never happen if you're doing like a facebook ad or like even a even a commercial right so like the engagement there is so genuine that everyone who comes to your site is, is is interested in you or interested in your product and that is that exposure is like immeasurable i mean it's just crazy Mm-hmm. So the, you don't have any doubt that you made the right decision in in walking away and and focusing on staying focused on how you're doing business now. No, yeah, excellent. And the white pipes I read sold out. After yes, the show, white, right? <laughs> which was so funny too because I never would have thought white would be like such a popular color. Mm-hmm. Um, we we ordered tons of of black and gray just to make sure that you know because those are our best sellers. And white, I figured, would do as well as any other color. Right. But everybody loves white. Everyone wants to wear white. <laughs> like winter white, I guess. Winter white. And you have to produce more, right? Then you have to go back yep. to production. That's excellent. I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm proud of you, too, for not just for walking away. I think, um, as you said, for standing up for yourself and really getting clear on the kind of business that you wanted to have in the long run. If you were trying to just sell it and get rid of it, it might have been a different decision. But it sounds like Nice Pipes is something personal for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. What would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? You know, I think what's interesting is the older I get, I feel like the better I know myself and the more I, I put myself out there and and, and I'm in these like riskier, what would be like a riskier situation or daring greatly as Brene would say, Mm -hmm. the more I realize that, um, Trusting your gut, and people told me this when I started my business, and I would say, yeah, yeah, no, I know, trusting your gut, but mm-hmm. I didn't actually, you know, feel confident enough to do it, 
And now I do. And what's, what's interesting is that I'm not always right. Like I'll trust my gut and I'm not always right. Sometimes I'm wrong, but you are onto something. You know, there's something there that's right for you or right for your business and which and will lead you in the right direction. So I think for me, that's like the number one thing that I try to do now when I when I have to make a decision is like, how, what do I really feel about this? You know, because we kind of turn outwards, so especially when you start a business in a field that you don't know. I was turning outwards so much for advice and so much for direction that now to kind of turn inward again and like trust what I think instead of asking other people what I should do. Um, that that's sort of been the transition and what I've what I've had to learn through being an entrepreneur. What would you say your support network looks like now? So definitely my husband. I mean, he's just like, I don't know where he came from. <laughs> I always I always tell people like I never I never really dated nice guys, but somehow I married like such a sweet, wonderful, supportive, thoughtful, um, smart guy. Mm -hmm. And it's like to come home and be, to be able to talk to him about work, for work, good things, work, bad things. And, and in both directions. I mean, he does the same with me with his work. Um, it makes me feel just so supported and so grounded. Um, and makes, makes me feel brave enough to be, uh, to take risks and to, to put myself out there. Um, and then, you know, my friends and family, of course, I mean, my, my parent, my mom, my stepfather, my sister, my husband's family is so wonderful. They're like the nicest people ever. I always say I, don't, I got lucky with, with a wonderful husband. And then I got even luckier with my in-laws because mm -hmm. they're just the most wonderful people. Um, and I have an amazing group of friends from college too. And it's just, I think it's so key to feel like there are people you can call, when you need support, I, I like, I just think, and, and I feel, and I also feel comfortable enough to call them and be vulnerable on the phone with them right? or in person. Right. Cause that's a big part of it too. It's like, you can have people who love you, but you have to feel comfortable enough that they're going to receive whatever, you know, and I'm sure you saw the Brene Brown, like the empathy video that mm -hmm. she does. Yeah. You know, like you have to have people that will just be in it with you. And I have a lot of people that will be in it with me. Right. And that's the thing. Create finding um, people. I always say people who understand your type of crazy. I just think as an entrepreneur, there are things that we're going to do or leaps we're going to take that everybody might not understand. But in the same way, as you said, with empathy, finding people who will support you through that no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think identifying like what friendships help you in different like I have friends who help me with work stuff and then I have friends who help me with personal stuff mm -hmm. and then I have friends who help me with like family stuff you know it's like sometimes it's also just identifying like what that person can support you with and and being okay that not everyone is going to be everything to you right absolutely so in closing Lisa if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally who would that be and what would you say um, um do I can I pick two or I have to pick one you can pick two I'll let you slide <laughs> <laughs> so I you know I didn't really get I didn't get a chance to talk about it that much but I will say my dad who always through my whole life um made me feel very um capable and very smart and very special and I think that my the the way that he looked at me and the way he encouraged my um analytical mind because he was very analytical um made me find like place a lot of value in, in how well my brain could work because he you know placed a lot of value there and I think that really has helped me be this sort of person that I am now mm -hmm. um so I definitely attribute a huge piece of of who I am to him and then my husband, who is just like, as I said, just, I don't know where he came from. He is just so wonderful. And he, no matter what, what happens in my life, professionally, personally, I feel like he's having him just makes everything better Aww, um, so and makes sweet. everything good. Like there's no, there's no bad because he's, because he's there. There's, you know, nothing is so bad because I have him and I think that's that's huge, huge. 
huge and now you're about to have a baby and now we're gonna have a baby baby makes three i love it (laughs) so tell us lisa how we can support you i'll have links to the website and everything but just so everyone can hear it again and any social media you want us to follow or anything else you want us to know about um i would just say you know how can you support it i mean i first of all i love the name of your podcast support sex day i think it's so amazing and i one of the things i love so much about about being an entrepreneur and about nice pipes is this chance to connect with with people like-minded people like you and like Mm -hmm. jen and i just like i you know i don't i just want to all support each other i can't think of anything i mean of course go check out our site go check out our products if anyone has any questions, email us. If anyone has got any questions for me, email me. I try to make myself available to anyone and everyone. If anyone's looking to start a business and needs help or advice, email us. Um, I love this, like, growing this community of support. I think it's more meaningful than selling anything. Excellent. You're so great. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate you. I, I mean, I love your story and what you're doing. I think I saw Nice Pipes at an event years ago. I don't remember where, but then I know Jen Groover, who was also on the podcast, connected us. So I'm so happy to get to talk to you and just share your story. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to uh, to be able to do this with you guys today. Of course. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? About anything. About anything. Oh, yeah. um, believe in yourself is a huge one. Um, and figure out what you want to do. And once you do, like, get a plan together and then execute on that plan. Um, Some of us get caught up, like, we get stuck in one of those phases, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can get through those three and no matter what the finished product is, you'll, you'll, you'll have, like, completed a life cycle. And I think being able to do that is what helps you to grow and to create opportunities that that you have to be in it right you have to be out there in it in in the playing field for something great to happen excellent lisa thank you so much i appreciate you hold on one second all right i hope you enjoyed that interview with lisa bendero be sure to go check her out at nicepipesapparel.com and as i said you can go to support is sexy podcast.com to see all of the information resources books All of the links are there waiting for you. Supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the search box and just type Lisa, L-I-S-A, and her show notes page will pop up with all of that information. Also, while you're there, be sure to hit subscribe in the top bar so that you can subscribe to our email list so you don't miss an episode. Five days a week, we're here for you on the podcast, but I don't want you to miss anything. So subscribe to our email list. No spam, only the good stuff. We don't want you to miss anything. All right. So thank you so much as always for listening. And now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.